Hey, everybody. Uh, with us once again, Paul Craig Roberts, the former Assistant Treasury Secretary under the Reagan administration, here to explain what is going on now with this new approach, the Great Reset. Paul has done a series of articles called The Great Dispossession, how they're going to transform your assets into collateral for them, the big guys. So, Paul, you're saying this came about through regulation without anybody really noticing. So, Paul, go ahead, explain. Okay. Well, um, that's what uh, I tried to do in part two, is to explain the, or to give an overview of the uh, regulatory approach they took in order that we are no longer owners of our own financial assets or bank deposits uh, in the event that the intermediary holding our accounts uh, becomes financial, financially troubled. At that moment, the intermediary holding our accounts it's their creditors who take possession of our assets. And that is what a bail-in means. And, and an, inter an intermediary is what, Paul, for those who may not be familiar with the term? Well, it's uh, wherever your account is, wherever your uh, bank balances are deposited, you know, if it's Wells Fargo or, or whatever bank, uh, where who holds your stock and bond uh, certificates? Is it Merrill Lynch? Is it Swab? You know where yeah. uh, they are account providers. They are uh, financial intermediaries. Uh, uh, they uh, that's where you park your holdings. You see, a, a long time ago, I think people were personally issued stock certificates. Right. And the stock certificate was numbered and had their name on it. And uh, people uh, kept them at home or in their filing cabinets or in their bank safety deposit box or something. And then uh, they moved to uh, uh, you know, book entries. And in a book entry, uh, it no longer has your name. No, you are no, no longer uh, own any particular piece of paper that's a stock certificate, for example, or any particular bond that has a number with your name. Uh, you now, all of your holdings are simply book entries. The account provider has a record that you have 100 shares of this. But your ownership is not associated with any particular shares. There's no, there's no direct link between you and uh, any particular share or bond. So this was one of the changes, one of the regulatory changes that they, they made uh, and because it does now remove you from any ownership claim to any specific uh, share document or bond document. All right. So what what did they uh, what did they do? Um, uh, they, they of course uh, uh, removed uh, the direct ownership of specific shares and replace it with what they call book entries. And they claim that was because there was a backlog, right? So this is more efficient. That's what they claimed. Well, they said that um, it, it took too much time to change ownership of individually owned shares every time they were bought and sold. Mm -hmm. And that uh, so th this was what they said. And this may have been an honest reason, uh, but nevertheless, it was important to the regulatory changes that they went on to make, uh, which uh, deprive us of our ownership claims in the event of a major financial crisis. Now, it, it, it doesn't deprive you uh, if just 
your bank fails. Uh, if it's just an individual bank, um, and uh, you don't, uh, you're not deprived of your ownership. But if there is a general financial collapse, then everyone is deprived uh, because uh, they said they're no longer going to use central bank bank money uh, to bail out the system. They're going to use our deposits in the system. All right. That's the big change. Now, so um, once you have uh, book entries uh, and there's no identification of any share with any particular individual, then you can pool all of the securities. And so they uh, created what they call central security depositories. They call them uh, CSD. And each uh, country has a uh, central security depository in which all of the equities are pooled, uh, the bonds are pooled, and of course, uh, bank deposits. Now, they may be separate for stocks and bonds and bank deposits. I don't know that they're all in the same pool or they have three separate pools, but they are pooled on a national basis. And all of the nations, this, this, is, this applies to the Western world, all of the national pools are linked into an international central pool. And what this does, it gives the creditors instantaneous access to our deposits as their collateral in the event of a financial crisis. So the pooling of the assets nationally and then linked internationally was achieved over time through uh, regulatory actions. Now there were problems along the way. They had to, for example, uh, what they call harmonize the United States with Europe. And the reason was that uh, in, uh, in uh, certain European countries, uh, the owner of the share uh, was identified as the shareholder, and they were absolutely and totally protected against uh, their shares being taken from them in any way. So it took some years, I think about 10 years, to uh, get these European countries to uh, agree to changes so that basically uh, they, they're they protected. Uh, uh, owners of shares lost that protection. So um, what... Um, uh, Webb, who wrote the book that I'm reporting on, what he said is that uh, um, in a report as long ago as 2013, that's 11 years ago, the Bank uh, for International Settlements, you know, this is the central bank's bank, uh, so the Bank for International S uh, Settlements, the Committee on the Global Financial System, uh, uh, says that uh, all collateral, all our stocks and bonds, uh, are, are now available to secured creditors. And uh, this mechanism is in place. It provides cross-border mobility of collateral. Now get these words from the collateral giver <laughs> us <laughs> to the collateral taker. Not that the we have They actually use these words. Yeah, so, not that we have any choice in the giving. <laughs> yeah, you see, you, you're you no longer an owner. You are a collateral giver. And 
the creditor is no longer uh, holding an empty bag. He is a collateral taker. Uh, this seems so incredible, Paul. I mean, you're going to go out and explain more of it. I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. that this yeah. change has occurred yeah. And nobody either noticed it or those who didn't notice it don't care. I mean, you know, how and people good won't, is... and people won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> so now look, here's what and now here's what Webb says. Webb says <clears throat> that these arrangements were quote designed and deliberately executed to move control of collateral to the largest secured predators behind the derivative complex. This is the sub subterfuge. This is the end game of it all. So they did this for that reason. Now, uh, 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 I mentioned that, uh, you see, the first time they brought in this system, uh, only three countries signed on in the United States, Switzerland, and the island somewhere, Mauritius. <laughs> the EU would not sign because uh, countries like Sweden and Finland, uh, the purchases of securities had invo inviolable rights. Nobody could violate their rights. And they were based on an ancient uh, legal principle call called uh, uh, Lex Re Cite which means uh, uh, the, the law of the region, the law of the, of the place. And so uh, they couldn't overcome uh, domestic laws with their international arrangements in the countries that had this ancient basis for their ownership rights. So they had to get rid of that. And... Um, and as we said, uh, they use uh, paperwork crisis to get rid of uh, uh, your um, direct ownership of specific shares. Okay, and then what they did, uh, they, um, they quietly amended the United States Uniform Commercial Code. Um, and by, by the way, Paul, let's remind the viewers, as we already said in part one, this was all done by regulatory agencies, not by Congress. And Congress had no say in this, probably didn't even know about it. So the regulatory yeah. agencies are making these changes in, in, right. in a law, actually. That's right. People, that's true. And, and, and it's not unusual. Uh, uh, no one really understands that we... The, that the regulatory ag agencies make more laws than Congress. Yeah. And uh, they've essentially appropriated uh, the lawmaking powers from Congress. Now, um, um, and, and as we've already said, uh, you, you no longer are, are said to be an owner of a security, you are said to be an entitlement holder of the security. And that entitlement depends on there being no financial crisis. Hmm. All right. Now, um, let's see. Here, so, so here are, here are changes in the U.S. Uniform Commercial Code that were quietly put in place by regulators. Uh, and one of them I mentioned is that, you, that you're now a security, uh, you have a security entitlement. You're an entitlement holder. Okay. Uh, another is that all securities are held in unsegregated pooled form. So the security is used as collateral and, and those allegedly uh, prevented from being used as collateral um, are held in the same pool. So there are no longer any segregated securities. All right. And then another change uh, is that uh, the only rights entitlement holders have over 
what used to be their property is after the crisis, if there's anything left of the pool securities, the owners have a pro rata share of what's left. So uh, whatever, I, I suppose it's weighted by the size of your uh, original deposit. That could be uh, pennies on the dollar. You get back pennies on the dollar, if anything. If anything. Okay, now, now this is all now in the code. Uh, th these aren't proposals. These are actual things. <laughs> um, and uh, they have taken away uh, the right of what they call revindication, which uh, allowed you to grab your securities in the event of troubles or pending troubles. So you no longer can see trouble come in and get your securities back. And um, the uh, uh, the people holding your deposits, you know, the intermediary or the account providers, as they are called, they can legally borrow pool pool securities uh, in order to collateralize their own proprietary trading. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and then uh, they have a safe harbor provision, which assures the secured creditors a priority claim to the pool securities. Uh, you know, in other words, the account holder no longer has any rights in the event of a crisis. Now, uh, and and Webb reports that even though we don't know anything about this, uh, that the absolute priority claim of the secured creditors to pool client securities has already been upheld by the courts. Really? I think it I think if I remember correctly, he says in the Lehman Brothers case. So if somebody, Lehman, Lehman Brothers failed in the last crisis. So well, they let it fail. And I think they let it fail as a test in the well, courts. Somebody, somebody challenged it in court, and the courts decided that uh, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's Webb's report. And, I, and he doesn't, he, he's not making these things up. Um, so they already set the precedent oh, in court. Huh? They already set the legal precedent. That'll yeah. Continue yeah. That, that's right. Yeah. And, and all of these changes I'm describing, he walks through the actual regulations and the dates right. and the actual agency that did it and uh, quotes them or they're in italics. And so he, he walks you through this. So it's impossible for anybody to make all this up. <laughs> I myself haven't gone and gotten all these regulations and done what he's done. I'm reporting what he did. All right. Now, now uh, here, um, He, what he also web provides is a 20 page um, questionnaire from the uh, European Communities Legal Certainty Group to the New York Federal Reserve Bank uh, asking uh, about this new system that Washington is creating by regulations and and and, and imposing on the the western countries on on the eu and and so uh, here's some of the questions that the european community legal certainty group asked they ask um the fed the federal reserve bank of new york which is the policy arm of the federal reserve system 
they ask if investors have rights attaching to particular securities in pooled securities. The New York Fed said no. Uh, they ask if investors are protected against the insolvency of an, um, an intermediary or, or depository or account provider. And the Fed answered, creditors have priority over the claims of entitlement holders. Huh. Enti remember now, entitlement holder is you. You think you're the owner, but you're not. Yeah. Okay, the Fed was asked if creditors still had priority over owners if a deposit, uh, a deposit provider or intermediary uh, involved uh, if the failure of that intermediary involved fault, negligence, or breach of duty. And the, and the Fed answered, in terms, this is quote, in terms of the interests that the title holder has in the financial assets credited to his securities account, Regardless of fault, fraud, or negligence of the security in a mediary under Article 8, the entitlement holder has only a pro rata share in the securities, in the securities intermediaries' interest in the financial assets in question. So, even in other words, yeah, yeah. If, if you way. lose everything to fraud, you only have a prorated share of anything that's left. <laughs> In other words, they are immune to suffering from fraud, negligence, dereliction of duty. So, uh, in short, you see the the omnibus the omnibus accounts where everything's pooled. The pool accounts. Uh, <clears throat> so the and which means individual securities can't be identified with specific investors. So when bankruptcy occurs, causing default of the account provider, clients are left with nothing uh, but a contractual claim and have to line up with all other unsecured creditors. So the owner becomes an unsecured creditor. Well, this is out of the world. This is right out of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's not. <laughs> now, so uh, they have, through these regulatory changes, uh, achieved their aim, which is that all securities are now collateral for creditors. So, uh, and, and they have in place all the linkage from the uh, uh, national depository institutions to the international deposit institutions uh, uh, under what they call comprehensive collateral management. <laughs> now, um, the regulatory authorities themselves raise a question. Um, what happens if all the pools of collateral are insufficient to cover the claims of secured creditors. And, and that leaves the central clearing party, they call the CCP, uh, holding the bag. So what happens if having taken all the stocks and bonds and bank deposits, <laughs> the the claims of the secured 
creditors aren't met. And so here is, I'm, I want to read this. The, you remember, we already referred to the 2013 uh, Bank of International Settlements Global Financial Committee report, right? All right. Well, this report also says that if there is insufficient pool collateral, you mean our stocks and bonds, to prevent the collapse of the financial system, by which I think they mean the mega banks, then non-collateral has to be transformed into collateral. Now, what does this mean? Uh -oh. What non-collateral is and how it is transformed is not clear, uh, at least to me. All right, Paul, my big question is, I've been waiting to ask you this, you know, collateral transformation, does that mean that if you own your own home, mortgage-free, or a car that you've already paid for, or other property you've already paid off, does that mean that that's also subject to collateral transformation, that it could seize it? I, I, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, I can't answer it, but I. what other assets could it be? And it fits the pattern of making us the responsible for a failure it's our fault and so we lose our assets so that means if you didn't lose enough you probably could be sued for any remaining assets you have so yes it could be your debt-free car your debt-free home your debt-free farm <laughs> your, your, your debt-free uh, gold or silver holdings i mean uh, let me finish reading this thing. Uh, so if there's not enough pooled assets for them to take, then non-collateral has to be transformed into collateral. What is this? How does the transformation take place? Well, the Bank of International Settlements Global Capital uh, committee's report says, quote, some market participants may need to exchange available but ineligible as collateral securities for other securities that meet eligibility criteria as collateral in order to fulfill their collateral obligations undertaking transactions to achieve this outcome has been defined as quote collateral transformation so it seems to be saying that uh, some market participants well that's us we own stocks and bonds and our stocks and bonds aren't enough to meet the creditors' demand, so we may need to exchange available but otherwise uh, ineligible as collateral securities for some other paper they'll give us <laughs> that meets the eligibility criteria so they can take those securities too. Now, what... What are these securities? I can't say. I don't know. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe it's um, uh, maybe you holding somebody's loan. You know, uh, some there have been uh, times when people who sell their house hold the loan. They have a lien on the mortgage, and <clears throat> and they rely on the income payments from the purchaser. Uh, they, they get uh, back uh, capital and interest. Well, uh, maybe that's what they're talking about. Uh, maybe you are, uh, you provide a local limousine service or local taxi service. Uh, you've got um, a fleet of cars. Or maybe you uh, supply local ambulance service and you have a fleet of ambulances and, and you've also got a, 
an account at Merrill Lynch and Merrill Lynch gets in trouble. I mean, I'm just using Merrill Lynch as an example of an account provider, not saying they're in trouble. And, and, uh, but, uh, all the collateral is not enough. And they come to you and say, well, look, uh, here, uh, we're trading you this security for your ownership of your ambulances or your taxis or your limos. And here's, here's your document. Now we've got those. And so uh, maybe that's what's going on. I don't know. It's, but they're talking about transforming non eligible collateral into eligible. Now, eligible is what they can seize. <laughs> now, Webb says that the collateral transformation is simply the encumbrance of any and all types of client assets under swap contracts, which end up in the derivatives complex. So they may be talking about some kinds of derivatives that that ordinary people don't hold, you know? I mean, or don't know it if they hold them. <laughs> and he says that this is done without the knowledge of the clients who were led to believe that they safely own these securities and it serves no beneficent purpose whatsoever for the clients only for the creditor holders. So he says it's the encumbrance of any and all types of client assets under swap contracts, which end up in the derivatives complex. So that's maybe the capital that's not eligible that has to be transformed. Well, uh, one of our viewers who looked at the part one of the Great Disposition, uh, asked uh, me to ask you, uh, what about those who have cryptocurrency? What happens then with what's going on that we just I, I don't know. There's nothing said here about cryptocurrency except uh, in part three. Uh, Webb, uh, I point out that Webb says that in the next crisis, it will be used to introduce central bank digital currency because that gives them complete control. And of course, if we have uh, uh, digital currency from the central bank, they will not permit any private digital currency. Just like today, uh, the United States does not permit anybody else to offer us a currency <laughs> when you have to use U.S. currency, Federal Reserve notes. And so if, if we cease having uh, paper currency that you can make uh, untraceable payments with, that, that you can store as a hoard times of emergency or for need, if they replace that with digital currency, which you cannot make untraceable payments <laughs> and you cannot put under your mattress. <laughs> well, there's, there was something of a precedent here in uh, 29 with the stock market crash. They seized the gold, didn't they? Private ownership of gold? Uh, not in 29, but uh, in the early 30s. Early 30s, yeah. They, Following they, the crash. They, yeah, following the crash uh, in the early 30s, they required uh, people to turn in their gold coins. Um, they could no longer have, uh, and gold, gold coins were no longer considered uh, a, a legal means of payment. And if you didn't turn them in, the penalties were quite harsh. There were large fines and substantial prison sentences. So, uh, for reason, for some reasons, they wanted people not to have gold. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, about the reasons. Uh, there was some uh, 
reason given that may have been concocted, and it was that uh, uh, they couldn't be on the go standard with uh, people uh, scared and taking refuge in gold and take and holding gold uh, because uh, if you were on a gold standard, the standard and people were holding gold. You didn't have any gold on which to expand the money supply. Mm. And so they had to uh, confiscate the gold so they could expand the money supply. I think that is, you know, when I learned all this was a long time ago and I haven't had to use it and I haven't been in the classroom for years teaching. So this is memory, but I think that is the reason they gave but clearly it, it reduced people's uh, alternatives. They couldn't really any longer protect themselves from inflation, for example. <laughs> well, Paul, it looks like we're heading into some deep uh, doo-doo here. Now, part three, which will follow this, uh, what are you going to explain in part three? Uh, part three, uh, if I remember, <laughs> you know, I write so many articles, <laughs> sometimes forget. Uh, part three, I think, is my explanation of Webb's uh, case that a very serious, in fact, the worst in history financial crisis is pending. It's awaiting us. It's near at hand. And wh why is this? And what he says the consequences are likely to be. And, and Paul, for those who are interested in uh, obtaining the book, uh, it's available online, isn't it? Yes, there's a link to it in, in uh, part one of my explication. Part one of the great uh, dispossession is the link. And uh, you can also purchase a copy for uh, $10, uh, which I did. And uh, online, it's free. And it's David Rogers Webb is the author, and the name of his book is The Great Taking. Great Taking. And it was published in 2023. You know, it's only a few months old now. Yeah. And uh, he made it free so people would read it. And uh, you have to pay for the printed copy simply because their cost of printing and distribution. Uh, so uh, he's not, uh, he's not, um, making money marketing the book. It's not, he's, he's trying to make people aware. And uh, he says it's extremely difficult. And uh, I know I'm finding, I'm finding the same, I'm finding the same thing. Uh, but, um, you know, whether or not Webb is right, uh, uh, about uh, how close this financial crisis is, uh, there, it does seem unavoidable because, first of all, uh, there are more derivatives. The, the derivatives are multiples of world gross domestic product. There's not enough assets in existence <laughs> to cover the derivatives. And, and just like the previous crisis, people don't understand these derivatives, even the people dealing in them. And, and, and also, we uh, are confronted with a very unusual situation where the Federal Reserve seems to be on purpose driving us into a collapse. Why do I say that? Well, because we had a decade or a decade and a half of uh, essentially zero interest rates. The entire financial system is loaded up with uh, low interest assets. And now the cost of money is five times what it was. <laughs> so the banks are in trouble. What, another regional bank, a smaller one, just failed again. It's just, I just read the announcement today. So when when you have, uh, say, a, a 1% bond, and then the Fed raises uh, 
interest rates from zero to 5%, your 1% security just lost 80% of its value. You see, this is, this is how you get a financial crisis. You destroy the value of the assets on the bank's balance sheets by raising interest rates. But Paul, if it was done on purpose, what was the purpose? It's what Webb says, you will own nothing. <laughs> Control, you will own nothing and neither will the billionaires. Uh, and you will be issued digital currency, which they can monitor your use of. Yes, so yeah. you, have lost, you have lost all financial independence. You're a totally controlled person. Yeah, because they watch what you buy, what you sell. Everything's traced for digital. And they can disapprove it. Yeah. Or they can punish you, suppose you're a dissident. Yeah. Uh, so Elon Musk will have to shut up. So will I. So will you. <laughs> or we just won't have any money. We can't buy groceries or pay utility bills or whatever. And so, uh, and you see, and this is how it fits in with the World Economic Forum. That's what Klaus Schwab's been trying to build toward for 50 years. You will own nothing. And be happy. So, and be happy. Yeah, so uh, it's, yeah, it's total control of the population. So, uh, and, and we know that, uh, you know, Bill Gates, these kind of people, they talk in these terms. Yeah. And we know that the World Economic Forum now is a big prestige organization. If, you, if you're a corporate CEO and you're not a member, you are low down on the totem pole. If you're if you're an intellectual and you're not a member, you don't count. You were invited once to the World Economic Forum, but not invited back. How come? Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I didn't. Uh, I thought it was just somebody on the mate creating an organization to boost themselves, and um, it was just a social scene, and. It, that didn't interest me. I didn't realize that it was really a, 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 an opportunity to reset the whole social, political, economic system. I don't think most of the members did. I mean, the, the people who joined, I don't think most of them uh, did understand that or even today understand it. They, I think they see it as social status. It means they're somebody. They're important. They, it's like being in the top country club that only the biggest guys can get into. And the next level have to go to another country club. And um, it, it's, like, it's, it's like a form of social competition. And uh, I think uh, that's the way it's seen by most of the members. I think most members don't realize uh, that this is an actual serious effort to completely alter the social, economic, and political systems of the world. And there'll be a very few people in charge. And, you know, uh, maybe we should end it on, on uh, for those who follow biblical prophecy, the mark of the beast, which <laughs> everyone had a bear if they were to buy or sell anything. It's, you know, it's just like that. That's what's, you know, it's impossible to, to believe uh, somebody two, 3,000 years ago, whenever that was in, in the Bible, uh, it could be that kind of a forecaster or know the future like that. <laughs> but uh, it certainly, it certainly fits. Um, and what Webb says, the outcome of this certainly fits the World Economic Forum's agenda. And why else make these regulatory changes? You know? It's not, it's not accidental. It's, it, it can't be accidental. And they intentionally created opposition in the public to the 
central bank bailout in 2008. You know, the people all mad. Why are they bailing out the banks? Why are they bailing out the banks? They should let the banks fail. Let the banks use their own assets. Blah, you know, and they encouraged that. And the media encouraged that. And so they said, okay, we won't have any more bailouts. We have a bail-in. <laughs> and, and, the, and the people thought the bail-in meant the bank's money would be used, not theirs. <laughs> and they didn't realize they didn't have any money <laughs> if there's a financial crisis because it belongs to the creditors of the bank. Yeah, or, or, or creditors, well, you have to or creditors of Schwab or Merrill Lynch or whoever, uh, you know. And in these types of crises, everybody is in trouble. You have to remember in the last crisis, uh, Merrill Lynch did not survive as an independent firm. It became uh, a subsidiary of the Bank of America. In other words, the big banks bought all the failing firms. And even Lehman Brothers was let go. You may remember the Bear Stearns was a Wall Street firm. They disappeared. So you get more and more concentrate. Every time there's a financial crisis, the concentration in the financial system increases. Yeah. So we even see mergers between the largest banks, like Chase Manhattan Bank merged with J.P. Morgan. Well, these were the two biggest banks in the world, probably, close to it, and they become one bank. It, so, see, all of this has been increasing concentration. The same thing with the media. Yeah. You know, uh, in, the, in the last years of the Clinton regime, uh, six mega corporations were allowed to buy up 90% of the American media. Right. So there's no longer any prospect of an independent media, even if there was no woke stuff and, and, and no pro-Democrat media stuff and, and no control stuff and no imposed agendas. There's still not an independent media. And it's happening throughout the country. You know, the big box stores are destroying all the family businesses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, you know uh, agribusiness is destroying individual farmers. You, you just wh wherever you look, the opportunity for somebody to do something independently is shrunk dramatically. And, you know, and all the uh, manufacturing jobs are gone. We sent them off to Asia, to China, to Mexico. So, and we're, and we're filling up with third world peoples without any tech skills. And apparently, according to reports, uh, you know, the, the job uh, increases that Biden is talking about uh, were actually filled by migrants, not, not by citizens. So the new job creation went largely to illegals. Yeah, and you have to understand the, the jobs they're talking about is working in chicken factories. Yeah. Where they slaughter chickens and working in the stockyards where they slaughter cattle and and uh, the and there are in a whole variety of very low paid uh, shelf stocking jobs. Uh, there's no and, and almost all these jobs uh, that they report, they are domestic services, and they're part time. Yeah. They're part time jobs. They, uh, you don't get enough income from them uh, to support a mortgage payment or uh, anything like that. So they're not uh, real jobs. They're not. They're not jobs that constitute ladders of upward mobility. And um, there's no such thing any longer as a, a blue collar working class. So, uh, a, a, blue, a blue collar middle class, I mean, you know, the, the manufacturing workers were well paid and they could send kids to college. And, and at the same time, we see the cost of all education skyrocketing. I mean, you know, these kids uh, that, uh, 
you go to schools on student loans, they come out and they're $50,000, $100,000, maybe $200,000 in debt. Well, how are they going to add a car payment and a mortgage payment? <laughs> so the whole system is is winding down. It's, it's, it's being strangled intentionally. You know, I spent uh, how many years, let's see, the 90s, 10s, at least 30 years, maybe longer. Uh, I've spent uh, pointing out that offshoring our manufacturing jobs was a way to transform a first world economy into a third world economy. Because you replace a, a high value added, high productivity job with a domestic service. Well, domestic services, this, this is India 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this was Mexico 50 years ago. It's, it's China 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, for and, the upfront money, yeah. the corporations you know, all, all outsource the jobs and uh, the, the industrial base of America has been shattered. For the sure. upfront, the upfront profits, you know, short short term vision, but upfront profits, and and they've destroyed uh, the domestic market. Yeah, because people haven't got any money; they don't have jobs that pay. Yeah, um, I just saw some uh, statistics, some report, and something like forty one percent of working Americans don't earn enough to buy a house to take a mortgage and i in the same i saw also 41 percent of the youth can't afford to pay rent they live at home with parents or grandparents yeah more and more 40 so. 41 percent yeah of the people you know who uh, you know college age to 25, 26 years old, I think it went higher. I think it actually went up into the 30s. They just simply can't survive on what they can earn and they have to live at home. And um, uh, well, how do you get family formation? <laughs> Another goal, you know, the nuclear family is no longer desired. Yeah, this, this, this is a way, this is a way to reset everything, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I kind of wish I had, I think I had the opportunity to join when I was there. I just can't remember. Um, I went with uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Brzezinski, and James R. Schlesinger. They were my colleagues at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. And it, 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 at the time, was affiliated with Georgetown University. And uh, I can't remember, you know, what we talked about or what they made of it. Or as I said, I thought it was a, uh, it was a, an organization being created to boost someone and to create an income scene for somebody. And um, and uh, but it, it it has been a successful sale, sale, because. Uh, executives want to be in it and, and members of Congress want to be in it and uh, intellectuals want to be in it. That means they're important. They get, they got this invitation. And so um, I think back when I went, I think uh, they didn't quite have all this crowd. And I think then I, I could have just uh, signed in and joined and, <laughs> kind of sorry I didn't because I could have, I may have caught on earlier than <laughs> than I did that this was not just a social climbing yeah. operation. Yeah, I have something real going on, and I still think most of the members don't know that. But I don't. You could, you could have kept an eye on things, what they're up to. But I, I, I'm sure they would have disinvited you, tossed you out eventually. <laughs> yeah, when well, they realized yeah. they were going along with the program. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think they would have convinced me that terminating. Liberty was a good idea. Anyway, Paul Craig Roberts, thanks again, <laughs> and uh, we'll continue with part three uh, soon. 
uh, to explain to everybody out there who is totally unaware of this, including myself, what is going on where we will own nothing and supposedly be happy according to those who are taking everything that we think we own. Paul yeah. Craig Roberts, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Larry.